Hello, welcome everyone to a Marble Hill Landscape Tour. We are delighted to be here with Mina Anderson, who is one of our wonderful volunteers, um, who has uh, taken on the challenge of doing a landscape tour virtually. We would love to be doing this landscape tour in person. However, we want to be able to do this virtually and so whet your appetite for being able to offer this tour um, monthly um, on site. So we are really pleased to see you here. Um, as you know, uh, Marble Hill is being revived and it's a really exciting opportunity to see that uh, our, our landscape is being invested in and historic elements are being brought back to life, but also investing in the biodiversity of our site uh, through the support of our amazing volunteers and of course Kate Slack, our wonderful um, head gardener. But this, this historic tour has been helped by Emily Parker, who is our historic um, landscape historian um, for English Heritage, um, and also through Kate as well. But each landscape volunteer brings um, their own passion and their own expertise to every site. And so we hope that you'll really enjoy um, Mina's take on uh, Marble Hill landscape. We are hugely um, excited about Marble Hill Revived, which will see the facilities in, um, uh, invested in and uh, restored and made better. And I'm hoping that many of you have had a chance to enjoy um, our wonderful cafe, um, which has just opened uh, for takeaway. And now you can actually sit outside, which is uh, hugely exciting. We'll see our house open for five days a week for free um, and we and as part of that the landscape will be part much more part of the history of our site. So I welcome Mina who is a blue badge tour guide um, and brings her volunteering expertise to a number of spaces all across um, our, our area but also wider London. Uh, she is a tour guide for the Poppy Factory and also for Orleans. Um, and we are really pleased that she's come to um, to share with us today a little bit about Marble Hill. Uh, she does a lot of her things actually physically, um, <laughs> but has embraced the virtual world and is broadcasting um, across across the world, sharing about London in its all its beauty. So we're really pleased to uh, to welcome Mina to come and give our, our landscape tour, and we hope it whets your appetite to come and see her and a number of the other amazing volunteer um, landscape tour guides that uh, will be part of our, our life at Marble Hill um, every month. And, uh, and so without further ado, Mina, it's lovely to have you here and thank you for coming and bringing your expertise. Rachel, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction and uh, how fabulous it was to wake up this morning to this glorious sunshine here in Marble Hill. And uh, I am so excited to share my passion for this particular little slice of uh, important local history. And uh, for the next half an hour or so, I will take you on a journey of uh, 300 years of what has been going on here. And I think this is a very appropriate place to start. We are looking down uh, from Richmond Hill, on top of the Richmond Hill, down towards Marble Hill. And I will be referring to this site and this view later on in my tour, because it was thanks to the Act of Parliament of 1902 that Marble Hill, the, the, the landscape was saved. And of course, this, this view it has been immortalized by Turner and Reynolds and so many other poets and painters. So, welcome to Marple Hill. Uh, this fabulous uh, landscape parkland of 66 acres of outstanding riverside parkland. London is a very, very green city. We are about 10 miles uh, southwest of London. London is a very green city. 47% of London is covered by parkland and wooded areas. And there are more trees in London than what there are people. So officially that qualifies uh, London to be called a forest. London is officially a forest. So here we are in Marble Hill, 
out of that, uh, that fabulous forest. And this view was saved by this Act of Parliament of 1902, uh, as I showed you in the previous, previous photo. I will be uh, concentrating on four quarters of the, of the uh, original historic landscape, which were the Orchard, Ice House, Nine Pin Bowling Alley, isn't that fabulous, Nine Pin Bowling Alley, and the Flower Orchard. Why is this particular area so important? Well, of course, Riverside's uh, properties were, or, or, or the Riverside itself was always very sought after because it was much more, uh, well, cleaner, quicker, and more comfortable to travel out of London by river. We are now in the beginning of 1700s, and London, London's population was 600,000 people. London had started to burst out of its Roman shell and started to move uh, towards the west, and which was, this was the, the area where the wealthy started to build their country retreats. Uh, and why here? Because there were two palaces, or actually three very, very important. Uh, there was uh, the remains of Richmond Palace and Richmond Lodge, there was Hampton Court and anything in between. There was sort of Alexander Pope came here, uh, David Garrick and uh, uh, Horace Walpole in, in Strawberry Hill. So when uh, Henrietta Howard in the beginning of 1700s, and, and we will talk about her in a minute, started to look for places to retire from court life, she didn't have to look very far because this was exactly what she wanted. I'm going to do a, read a little quote from a book by Tracy Borman, uh, King's Mistress, Queen's Servant. When it, it was quoted here that by the 18th century, the village of Twickenham, lying some 10 miles southwest of London, had become one of the most desirable places to live for those wishing to escape the noise and smells of the capital. Just two hours by barge from London, and within easy reach of Hampton Court and Richmond Lodge, it became a magnet for members of the fashionable society. Lady Mary uh, Wortley Montague, who spent every summer with her husband at the elegant Saville House, wrote to her friend in 1722, I'm at Twickenham, where there is at this time more company than in London. It has become a fashionable and the neighborhood so enlarged that this is more like Tunbridge and Bath than a country retreat. So Henrietta, so this is where she then, this fabulous lady who uh, uh, is, has left such an impact uh, still after 300 years. She uh, was orphaned at the age of 12. Her uh, father died uh, while fighting in a duel, and her mother then a few years later. So at the age of 12, she was orphaned. And she suffered all her life uh, uh, disability of, of, of not quite hearing properly. And uh, she married her husband in 1706. Her husband, Charles Howard, who was quoted of being ill-tempered, obstinate, drunken, extravagant, and brutal. But uh, Henrietta Howard, she was really, really uh, driven in a way that she wanted to have a better life for herself. And she traveled to Hanover and wanted to make acquaintance with the future King George I, and then uh, George II, his son, uh, which she, she did, because she famously became the mistress of uh, Prince of Wales, uh, the, the future King George II, and also was the lady of the bedchamber for his wife. So it was a sort of proper menage a trois happening, happening there. But that's not, that really is not the only thing that Henrietta should be remembered. She was really dedicated patron of arts and lively talented intellectual in her own right and passionate advocate for the rights of women because she was abused uh, uh, in her uh, relationship with her first husband. And she really uh, left uh, on the society and culture of all early Georgian England. Uh, she was so resonant, uh, well beyond the confines of the court and is still really, really embraced and it's an evidence, evidence today. 
And uh, Henrietta was also known to be sort of, she favored all the association that were uh, Horace Walpole's, uh, Robert Walpole's uh, enemies. So she sort of had her, her, her friends were these um, thinkers of, of, the, of the day. This time was also the height of the uh, uh, grand tours. This was the, uh, the time of uh, enlightenment and Henrietta embraced all that. She was a remarkable figure in Georgian society and magnet for culture and political elites, including these gentlemen here that we are looking at. The, uh, Alexander Pope, John Gay, Horace Walpole, and Jonathan Swift. And her entertaining rivaled the entertaining in, in, in the court. And quite interestingly, as, although she was the mistress of uh, Prince of Wales, future King George II, George II's wife, Queen Caroline, was equally intelligent. So she was good at welcoming people and intellectual and, and, and very knowledgeable. So it was these two, two ladies living at the same time in the same court that were said to be the most intelligent ladies of 1700s. So, so Henrietta had the court. These were, these were her friends. And, and, and a number of them lived very, very close to her, a couple of miles up the river. So they all had made sure that uh, the, the Twickenham Riverside or a few miles either side from Hampton Court Palace or Richmond Palace were the seat of their, their country retreats. So Henrietta then, what happened was that um, uh, in 1723, she got 11,500 pounds in, not just in money, but in jewelry and, uh, and in stocks. And she uh, well sent Earl of Eilie looking for land for her to retire, because she certainly didn't want to stay in court all her life. And in 1724, this land was bought. And Henrietta uh, knew exactly what she wanted. She was very, 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 let's go back to this. She was very, she knew what kind of a house she wanted to build. And uh, there's actually in the same book, there's a sort of lovely, lovely quotation of her, of her determined mind, how she wants her house to build. The influence that Henrietta had in, on her own house can be clearly praised. It's harmonic, architectural proportions owed much to the Palladian style that she so loved. This was a forefront of fashionable states. For the style, it was only just beginning to take hold in England, and its origins lay in the grand tours of Europe. So Henrietta, these men that she was so, so uh, uh, friendly with, they were also sort of they had been to Europe and they had seen all the what was going on because until 1713 it was quite difficult to go to Europe after the, the, the Treaty of Utrecht uh, the fabulous grand tour started when the aristocratic men went on the aristocratic back here and not only brought back paintings and artifacts but also garden ideas so this this Palladian villa uh, uh, was then built according to what Henrietta had seen, experienced, and heard. But she was very, very uh, uh, particular how the house had to be built. And she was not going to leave such an important project to a well-meaning amateur. So enter a gentleman called Roger Morris, who was told to build, and I quote, a naked carcass of a house so that Henrietta can then leave her own mark on it. And then a Charles Richman, who then became being, uh, Charles II's gardener later on, was there then to sort of help the gardens. And uh, Henrietta's interests expanded as it's again, quote, well beyond the tea and scandal. And she was super passionate uh, in, and, uh, in, in, in architectural projects and especially in garden design, and had such a knowledge on both of these subjects. And uh, here is a drawing 
of uh, Colin Campbell, who uh, this is from the um, from 1725, the previous Britannic goods, uh, just titled House in Twickenham. So, so it's a very plain house, but has got all the proportions of that archi architectural uh, fashion that was going on. Interestingly, I'm slightly just sort of uh, going, going slightly tearing off your, for the duration of, of one slide, because next door uh, is Orleans House, uh, James Johnston's house, and you can see exactly how the same, same uh, similar type of building is next door. This is also by, by uh, Colin Campbell, the drawing on the left, and if you see that uh, they are very, very similar. And I couldn't resist this because the church, uh, St. Mary's Twickenham, is also then built in the same style by the same architect, John James, who, who, who did uh, Orleans House. And then you are wondering, why on earth have I got uh, the Bridgerton photo there? I have got the Bridgerton wedding photo when Daphne and uh, uh, Duke of Hastings get married. The filming was done in the St. Mary's Church in Twickenham. So I thought I put that, that, that little, little bit of bit, of bit in. Henrietta is one of the, her favorite uh, friends, dearest, closest friends, was Alexander Pope, who lived a couple of miles up the river or up the road, down the road, literally next door neighbor. And when uh, Henrietta started looking for help, advice, uh people who would give her the right kind of support uh, she really didn't have to look far because alexander pope was there and uh, uh we have here an interesting drawing of the gardens uh of uh alexander pope's gardens and we can see that uh, in, a, in a couple of slides down it is quite uh mirror imaging the, 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 the gardens that Henrietta then initially uh, decided to build. So, so um, Alexander Pope was fundamental in, in uh, helping Henrietta and guide Henrietta in, in her garden plans. And here we have, I have slightly stretched this, this uh, image, this fabulous image from 1749. That was found, maybe if I say accidentally found, it's, it's, a, it's a bit strong, a too strong word. But in the beginning of 1990s, in uh, Norfolk Record Office, and uh, this is absolutely uh, well accurate of Henrietta's time, how the gardens looked like. And there are um, uh, indications that what was where. I will be referring to this particular map. Uh, quite a few times as we get deeper into the uh, landscape of Henrietta's gardens. Because here we have a uh, list of what was in this drawing. So here, are just uh, sort of, it's, it's quite um, challenging to read, but here it says it starts with the house, greenhouse, a seed, seed before the ice house, ice house in the thicket. Uh, flower garden, Trotso, Nine Pin Alley, Kitchen Garden, Poultry, and Charity Lawns. So, uh, that plus then um, uh, many, many, many other, other, as you can see, that list is long. So, referring to this, is uh, this map has now, in recent years, been very, very deeply. And now, the, uh, once we get totally up and run to do a tour in actual, in the crowns, uh, according to how Henrietta's garden was in, in uh, as in this image of 1749. And also, uh, interestingly, this, so 1746, the house is, is in, the, in the survey, uh, in, in the road map. So you can see, see the house, uh, uh, in the survey, which I find fascinating, that she had this huge land. Uh, it's more or less the same land that that surrounds the house at the moment. Although it was bought little by little, so it didn't it didn't start start that large. So what we have here here then is uh, an engraving by by Hector, and um, this 
just shows the house uh, that it, there was always an unobstructed view to the river. And uh, there was also always this avenue of trees. And um, uh, in Henrietta's time, the lower branches of the trees were cut. So they were like sort of on lollipop sticks. So that there was this always this vista from the, from the house to the river. Horse chestnuts, uh, and then also uh, that was sort of one of the one, one of the favorite favorite trees, and black poplar and white poplar, and uh, so so this is what what is hoping to be created uh, with the planting, so that the trees that now have been planted are about sort of five five years old. But quite interestingly, when Henriette was planting her trees. He got a complaint from the next door neighbor. It's not quite, I'm not quite sure which one of the next door neighbors, when she was planting 122 trees. So that wasn't quite well received by her, by her, by her neighbors. But it just shows this, this, this is another quite topographically accurate uh, engraving how the house looked like and, and how the gardens. So this is, this is another, other, one of the images that is quite often referred to as well. And then we are looking at, this is a, a, a slightly um, enlarged image uh, because we are now looking at the house here in the, in the middle. So where's my cursor here? Out in the middle. And then there are three other houses. What we are interested in, and we have got a, uh, a better images in the next slide, is the greenhouse and the summer house. But there was also China house because Henrietta was a huge collector of porcelain and, and, and China. So, so this shows that the house, um, the main house, certainly wasn't the only building on her estate. And here we have the garden house and, 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 and greenhouse. And in Henrietta's time, this was the fashion. If you remember that the, the grand tour, uh, tourists, these uh, aristocratic men, they have got a lot to answer for. And what they also, they brought this Italian influence of garden house and greenhouse. First of all, the greenhouses, they were very expensive because there was a lot of plants. Plants was heavily taxed until mid-Victorian mid times. Plants was heavily taxed and uh, uh, it was only the wealthiest people who were uh, able to able to have uh, houses and garden houses. Henrietta loved the sanctuary of her garden house. She had a sofa there, and she is uh, quoted in, on saying that here I am come to rest my tired limbs. So there she was. So it was a part of that estate that that it was like a sanctuary to her after she had retired from the court, that she, she was free from all, all, all that, and she was able to enjoy, entertain, and be with her friends, and rest her tired limbs in the, in the uh, garden house. Uh, also, Henrietta's, um, it was also a functioning garden in a way that, that also the Georgians, they loved to eat, they loved all the new foods that came into the country that came very often with the grand tourists, they were very uh, uh, excited. The Georgians drank from a deep cup of life. During their time, uh, the society changed. Information was within the people and they really were excited about everything. And food was exactly the same. This is sort of fabulous. She had a kitchen garden, more or less where the uh, uh, car park is today, and here we can sort of see see what she she has got sort of in in her kitchen garden. There are let me just sort of uh, read, take my note and read. It has the celery, endives, spinach, greens, potatoes, turnips, carrots, horseradish. So very normal normal foods. But then also same year it's listed there that there's butter cream, eggs, and chicken. So she had a sort of like a henry where she kept, kept uh, uh, chickens. So normal household. So provided only to her house and then her, her um, townhouse on Savile Row in London. So, so uh, I, I love this sort of that, that these documentations have been found and we can be really uh, 
uh, we can connect the dots what what's happening uh, during Henry at this time. And that's what we are trying to do is to sort of give a taste of Henrietta's life and of those fabulous gardens uh, when she was alive. Well, one thing that uh, all the uh, prominent country houses have is a grotto. And a grotto was something that, uh, again, the, the bases of the grotto are in ancient Greece. Very often they were built on, uh, over a sacred spring. But then in Renaissance Italy, uh, they revived these grottoes to lend an air of historical authenticity, authentic, authenticity uh, to their neoclassical villas and estates. So again, then the grand tourists picked up on that and brought it home. Uh, the idea of grottoes brought it home. And Henry, of course, had one. The one sample on the, on the left-hand side is a grotto from Goodwood House. So it's a, it isn't, isn't Henry at us. But if you look at the grotto that uh, have, has been so lovingly now, or is being so lovingly restored, it's, it's quite something. It was only found, uh, if that's the right word, in 1980s. And, um, it's, uh, there's, a, there's a poem, Anne Chambers' poem from 1760s, where she talks about all the different species of flowers and the planting when it really gets going. Uh, the, 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 the gardeners are hoping to plant exactly the same plants as were in Henrietta's, or in the poem and during her times which was myrtle, roses, lilacs, and etc. And this winding path down to the grotto uh, uh, was again something that Henrietta was super proud. The grotto, grottoes were sort of seen also as uh, must-have items. Uh, Alexander Pope down the river, Henrietta's very dear friend, had a grotto and, and uh, there is a grotto still uh, and uh, it is open a uh, few times, a few times a year, but it was it was the highlight for her. And Henry and her niece decorated the grotto with shells, and uh, it's it was seen that the grotto decorating was seen as a polite occupation for women. And there's a lovely little quote also when Henrietta, uh, Henrietta and her niece both say that they were they were they were uh, attaching the, the shells so much that their fingernails were all. Uh, in blood. So, so it was also, it, it was quite physical, physical work as well. But this will be ready uh, for, for people to enjoy in a year or so time. And then another absolute extravagance for, for the Georgians was, of course, the ice house. Uh, ice house, ice was collected. Very often, Thames froze. Thames froze. Uh, uh, and there were ice bears on Thames until early 1800s, and the Thames could freeze up to 28 centimeters thick. So that ice was harvested from whether it was from the Thames or, or ponds and put to ice houses. And the ice kept frozen for up to 18 months. And then that allowed then the, the aristocrats and people who had the means to build ice houses, to keep their drinks cool, make ice cream. Ice cream was the thing to offer when you, when you uh, were in church and court and you were dining. And again, I, I uh, mentioned that they loved mixing. They, 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 they were enthusiastic about everything. And when these new foods arrived, uh, they wanted everything. So they also mixed the ice creams more extravagant, the better. So in Henrietta's time, it was known that she had asparagus ice cream, truffle ice cream, artichoke, and parmesan ice cream. So I always say that if Heston Blumenthal thought that he invented this kind of cooking, uh, no, no, it was 300 years the Georgians loved their parmesan ice cream. And also bread ice cream, I find that is, is, is quite interesting. Ice House, I have two recent images taken over the weekend um, that, that you can see that it's all sort of taking place 
the the the, the planting the planting is it's it's happening uh, uh, and, and this is one of the four corners that I mentioned in the beginning, is the importance of Ice House. And there was a uh, tent to sit in front of the Ice House overlooking the river. Right, and this I love, I love Nine Pin Alley. So there is, uh, uh, the Nine Pin Alley was discovered by the archeologists quite recently. And the Nine Pin Alley, it was quite short-lived uh, pastime. It, it was only sort of popular for, for a few years, but enough for Henrietta to build her own nine pin alley. As you can see here, it was like skittles, it was like, like bowling. So here we have, we have the on the on the right hand side is the nine pin, uh, pin alley. And this is something that um, uh, will be open then for all of us to enjoy and play. So, so when, when this all uh, opens up and, and everything, everything is ready. So in the nine pin uh, bowling alley, it's going to have a very informal feel. There are sort of roses and uh, butcher's broom, hydrangeas, so uh, a lot of flowers. And um, uh, you can walk through this sort of winding path and um, go and play. Nine pin alley, nine pins, which I find absolutely just so fascinating. So this is one of the corners that I that, that I mentioned. So we are going more or less around the house, and uh, uh, I can't wait. So you, you will see me on the nine pin alley definitely come summer twenty twenty two, and this is something I couldn't couldn't uh, go past this because of course then there was pack of war, which was quite quite uh, interesting uh, pastime. But something bad happened in Twickenham. There's this sort of Mr. Patrick Blake was watching a tug of war at Marple Hill, Twickenham, on Thursday when he felt his chin touched. Looking down, he saw a hand being withdrawn and his necktie, which was a valuable, in which was a valuable uh, scarf pin, nearly pulled out. A man named Edward Paul was charged with a tempted death at uh, Brentford on Friday uh, and remanded, uh, remand being uh, ordered. So th this is, I, I mean, uh, you've got to love sort of the, 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 the society and sort of uh, uh, stealing a uh, necktie pin while doing pack of war. So it all happened in Marple Hill. And then of course, cricket. We can't ignore cricket because this is this is more or less where cricket is still played today. So uh, so this is over over sort of hundred hundred year old photo and cricket is still uh, important part of the fabric of Marble Hill. And this is a, a photo when it, it here calls or sort of drawing Marble Hall. Of course, then after Henrietta's time, the house passed on to her nieces and great niece and, and, and nephew even. And then in 1800s, I think the most prominent owners were Jonathan Keel. Uh, and then uh, towards the end of 1800s, the Cunards um, bought it and nearly, nearly demolished the house. But here we have sort of, a, we can still see here, this is about sort of 50 years uh, later, 60 years after Henrietta, um, planted the, the, the avenue of trees and they are still visible and there's the oval lawn in front of the house and uh, where she where she entertained um, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning that the entertainment was rivaling the court and I couldn't not put this because I just love this like everyday photo in Marble Hill uh, from 1908 uh, Already now it was sort of house was saved and it was it was safe uh, and here it, it is just sort of everyday life that's that life goes on around the house that has been always and is still today and hopefully for the generations very important parts of the uh, uh, local fabric right so here we have I, I let the today's site plan till the last, because it, it, it's a bit sort of confusing going around all these bits uh, and trying to get uh, the map ready in your head. The house here is in, in the middle. So the four corners, we have the ice house, the nine pin alley, and, uh, and then the, the orchards on the other side. So, so the, how, the most important 
aspects of the garden where these these uh, quarters and then of course there's the oval lawn and then there was the sort of the, the turning a turning circle most people came by road uh, by horses and carriages although it was uh, and and the, and the road was sort of on the side so it didn't go go directly in a in the middle 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 of the middle of the lawn although um most of these country houses had big uh, uh, boat houses and, and for people to arrive in when they came from London. But, but most here, uh, uh, people arrived by road. So there was a sort of turning circle. So if you go into, into Marple Hill and are at the back of the house, not Riverside, you can, you, you can still, still see that. But the whole of the estate, so here we have the new cafe. Let's go. I have got the photo, a recent photo of the cafe, which is in the stables. And the stables aren't from Henrietta's time. Henrietta's stables were here where the, uh, the uh, uh, car park is today. So that's where Henrietta's time, the, the stables are where. Uh, but the stables here are now, uh, they are from end of 1800s. During um, Jonathan Peel's time, he, when he was an occupant, he built for his very prominent horses, horses that sort of won a lot of awards. Those were those were for his horses. And today, as Rachel mentioned, we have a cafe there. Now opens newly, you can see, because this I also took over the weekend, so it's very, very uh, recent. So you can see people now relaxing, enjoying, uh, finally sitting outside, having a coffee with a friend. So welcome uh, uh, addition. To, to Marble Hill is this very beautiful cafe. And then of course, what else has been done there now recently? Not just uh, bringing the history to life, but uh, at, the, at the very fact we have the uh, rugby field that has been returned. And there's a little sort of, I would call adventure playground. I'm not sure if this is the, the, the right word for it, but it's nearly ready. I mean. Fabulous playground for, for, for the children. And then, of course, this is sort of the avenue of trees going down from the house towards the, uh, towards the uh, river is uh, Henrietta's Tree of Hope. Because Henrietta, as, as I mentioned in the beginning, she was in a very abusive relationship uh, uh, with her first husband. So uh, women who have also been in an abusive relationship in December, donated a tree, uh, Henrietta's Tree of Hope, and also then the, um, the, the morning, is it Saturday or Sunday, yoga, yoga group have donated a tree. So, so there's also this community spirit is huge in Marble Hill. And then of course, look at this grand old lady. That is the black walnut tree by the river gate. And, uh, we think that, first of all, it has been given a veteran status and it is about 250, 300 years old and it was possibly planted by Earl of Buckingham or Earl of Eilie, who uh, was born in, across the river in, in, in Ham House. And it said that it is a handsome healer. And, and uh, it also... Uh, lets out a smell or some kind of, uh, 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 whether it's smell or a bit of sort of sap, so that nothing grows or very, very little grows underneath it. So nothing then uh, takes away the nutrition that this uh, black walnut uh, um, acquires. And it's also, it, it is the sort of only, as we know, sort of living link to Henrietta's time. Interestingly, it's also home to, of course, as you can imagine, insects and, and a lot of uh, uh, flora and fauna uh, in, in, in the area. And as it grows old, it gets hollow. And very often, uh, I actually went on, on Kate Slack's uh, um, talk on uh, this black walnut tree, and she was saying that, that it gets hollow. And actually, sorry, it doesn't mean that it gets weak. Because if you think of an uh, aluminium pole, it's hollow, but it's still strong. And that's exactly how the black walnuts in our beautiful uh, land, in, in, in the landscape of, of Marble Hill is still dominating. It's being looked after 
acutely. It, 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 it is because it is, has coherent status. And it's thought that it is one of the largest and oldest black walnut trees in the country. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have done a tour of this, well, landscape tour of uh, gardens and landscape of a very passionate woman. Passionate woman who believed in what she uh, was, uh, what she was given, and she fought for her causes. She was, as we have learned, she was this absolutely uh, remarkable of her time in court, and then retiring here and keeping her friends close to her, building this beautiful house, this fabulous landscape and gardens. So what better place to retire than in, in our beautiful Marble Hill? So I hope to see you all on live live, live tour, which we hope to start from 11th of May onwards, running every month. And I look forward to uh, going around the gardens and smelling and touching these glorious uh, living artifacts. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mina, um, for your energy and uh, and a glorious rendition of um, a, a very difficult thing, giving a landscape tour virtually. <laughs> and there is no landscape in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And we just can't wait to have our community back to be able to do this in person. And um, and it's it, but we're so grateful for you taking up the mantle of uh, pulling this together and and delivering um, a, a fascinating talk. So thank you.